today's occasion, as uh, was rightly pointed out, is the commemoration of the 1931 uprising of uh, Kashmiris against the Dogra rule, when 22 uh, hapless, innocent Kashmiris were martyred. Now this struggle, one can recall, has been going on even before that. See, one is reminded of the long travail of the people of Kashmir under Mughal, Afghan, Sikh, British, Dogra, and now the Indian rule. Their struggle has waxed and waned, but never vanished. It has kept rekindling time and again, but so has persisted unabated oppression by the occupying power, India. Now, this is an informed uh, audience. Uh, they are well conversant with the genesis of the Kashmir dispute. But I would recall three milestones. Of course, there are 28 about Security Council resolutions on Kashmir dispute. But uh, as I said, uh, there are three milestones. One is, of course, the passage of the United Nations Security Council of 21st April 1948, 31st August 1948, and 5 January 1949. What did they say? They prescribed that the future of Kashmir will be determined in accordance with the wishes of the people of Kashmir to be ascertained through an impartial plebiscite conducted under the aegis of the United Nations. The second milestone was in 1951, when India organized these sham elections there and uh, portrayed that as if the people of Kashmir have decided to be part of India. But these security council acted and said that these elections or any other political chicanery cannot be a substitute for plebiscite and will not constitute a valid disposition of the territory. And the third milestone is 1998, when following the nuclear testing by India, followed by Pakistan, Security Council, while adopting it, resolution relating to these tests affirmed the need for settlement of Kashmir dispute in the interest of peace and security. So in other words, the nuclear dimensions of this dispute, of, uh, if this remains unresolved, that was highlighted. But the crisis has entered a new more ominous stage following these unilateral illegal measures adopted by the Indian government on 5th August and 31st October last year and 2nd April this year successively. These measures have sought to abolish Kashmir's special status and autonomy and change the demographic character of the territory, which is in complete violation of international law, I am referring to the Fourth Geneva Convention, is contrary to relevant UN resolutions, it is contrary to the Indian Constitution, it also violates the Simla Agreement and the Lahore Declaration. Now the Kashmir dispute has three aspects, political, legal, and human rights dimension. The political aspect is grounded in the faithful implementation of the Security Council resolutions, which I just referred to. But legally, the law of prescription 
is not applicable to Security Council resolutions. According to more than one Secretary General of the UN, Kofi Annan, Ban Ki-moon, and now with this, uh, sorry, Guterres, Antonio Guterres, they all have affirmed that Security Council resolutions do not lapse with the passage of time. They remain valid till they are implemented or rescinded by the Security Council itself. Or the parties agree something among themselves on a different settlement. Further, it is stated sometime that the Simla Agreement has ousted the authority of the UN and only now avenue available to settle this problem is through bilateral negotiations. As I said earlier, that Pakistan is not against negotiations by, to settle the dispute through bilateral negotiations. But what has been the experience? More than 45 high, summit level conferences have, have been held on, uh, on Kashmir, but they did not bear any fruit. So it means that peaceful negotiations, yes, but there are other means available also. Inquiry, conciliation, arbitration, judicial settlement. I think these are all specific settlement dispute mechanisms. So if one mechanism is not working, I think one has to consider opting some other specific settlement mechanism. Now that this, uh, and also the Charter of the United Nations says that if there is any contradiction between the obligations under a bilateral agreement and under the UN Charter, the obligations under the UN Charter will prevail. Now these political and legal aspects are very important, but they're not of instant nature. In the thing which is uh, staring us in our eyes is the abysmal human rights situation in the occupied Kashmir. That is very pressing, calling for urgent attention of the international community. But India's response to the Kashmiris people to struggle to exercise their uh, right of self-determination has been brutal and barbaric, resulting in deaths of some one million innocent people, maiming of thousands of others, all around material destruction. It has been an horrendous tale of repression marked by torture, arson, rape, extrajudicial killing, wailing widows, children and the aged, the missing persons, the unmarked mass graves, dotting the Kashmir Valley, they speak of the massive human rights violations being carried out by the Indian military and paramilitary forces deployed in the Indian occupied Kashmir. And the obnoxious use of civilians as human shield and subjecting them to pellet guns is quite common. One British newspaper has said, it looks as if pandemic of blind eyes have spread in the valley now. So many people have been affected by this uh, indiscriminate use of uh, pellet guns. So the people of occupied Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir, they are suffering the largest lockdown, rather longest lockdown, rather now double lockdown, they and this communication blackout and also uh, every kind of restriction is imposed on them. The genocide alert and organization has already warned of the danger of impending genocide of the people of occupied Kashmir. So of course there has been no reaction there is a now awakening in the international community. 
Uh, now more and more media, the Congress people, parliamentarians, both in Britain, in the United States, in the uh, European Union, all are now, you know, expressing their concern on what's happening. Of course, that is not enough, but I think things have started uh, moving. And uh, meanwhile, India's true face has been exposed. It's fighting war on three fronts now, internal against Muslims and other minorities in occupied Kashmir, and also against its neighbors, principally Pakistan, and now China as well. I want to, uh, you know, explain some uh, concepts, you know, or some issues which are raised in this connection. It is said that uh, it is a territorial dispute between India and Pakistan. No, it is not a territorial dispute. It is a dispute about the right of self-determination, a right which has been now become, as they said, just cogents. That is peremptory law, that uh, there cannot be any exceptions. Then it is said, as India alleges, that it is transborder terrorism. No, it is not. But if it is India's position or allegation is right, why it doesn't allow UNMOGIP, United Nations Military Observer Group in India and Pakistan, to examine, to investigate? They are not, or they don't allow even uh, other organizations or people uh, to visit the uh, territory, occupied territory, to verify facts. I think it is an indigenous struggle, indigenous struggle of the people of Kashmir and their durability and sustainability is loud and clear. So I think, I come to the last part, which is important one, and that is the recommendations. I think we have to now build a pressure on India. If necessary, by imposing sanctions bilaterally or through the United Nations. This fact has been emphasized by some other speakers also in this uh, webinar. I know it is difficult, but that has to be the target. And for that, we have to mobilize the international community, including the liberal elements in India. Secondly, we have to build on the momentum generated by two successive reports by United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. His third report is awaited. Particularly, the, his recommendation for the establishment of a commission of inquiry and to ensure respect for the right to self-determination of the people of Kashmir. This is the first time that the UN body has clearly, apart from the Security Council resolution, that after a long time, a UN body and that to dealing, which is dealing with the human rights, has come out with these two recommendations. And as has already been stated, we have to examine the option of taking India to the International Criminal Court for its crime against humanity, war crimes, and genocide in Indian occupied Kashmir. If uh, uh, you know the this uh, Burmese leader, you know Aung San Jin, if she can be called to the ICC, if the Yugoslav uh, leaders uh, who committed atrocities, they can be hauled up before the ICC. I think uh, the Indian leaders who are presiding over this uh, reign of terror in Kashmir, I think they become also a, a fit. A culprits to be uh, brought before the International Criminal Court. And uh, another recommendation would be that the growing interest of the international media and human rights NGOs in the matter has to be sustained. Now about the OIC, of course it has lent full support to the Kashmir cause. 
in all aspects. But I think member states may be now urged to walk the talk. They do adopt very, you know, strong resolutions, uh, but they don't follow it up by actions. Their relations with uh, India are not disturbed at all. Rather, sometimes their actions encourage India to persist in its uh, present policy. My another recommendation would be that the UN Secretary General's role, which is envisaged in Article 98 of the Charter, has to be activated. He has of late shown sensitivity to the dangerous situation evolving in the region over Kashmir, but he may be urged to adopt a more forthright stand and like OIC, appoint a special representative to follow the Kashmir situation. And Pakistan should keep working to garner support of the major powers, particularly the permanent members of the Security Council. They should be persuaded to eschew their narrow economic and commercial interests. Now, while trying to prevent Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir descending into a genocide situation and providing relief and succor to the brutalized people there, we should not for a moment allow ourselves to be deflected from the fundamental issue of allowing the people of Kashmir to exercise their right to self determination pledged to them by UN, India, Pakistan, and the rest of the international community. Pakistan should keep its policy of extending full moral, political, and diplomatic support to the Kashmir cause. There should be no dilution in it. One thing, another thing comes to my mind is India's aspiration to become a permanent member of the Security Council. Now, how can India have the temerity to aspire for such position of a body of whose resolution it openly trashes. India does not give any respect to the resolutions of the Security Council and wants to become a permanent member of the same body. Have you ever heard of a member being allowed to uh, a, a person being allowed to be, become a member of a club whose uh, uh, rules regulation uh, uh, that person doesn't uh, uh, respect. So I think uh, uh, there is no basis, no India doesn't have any credentials to be a permanent member of the Security Council given the policies it is pursuing inside India vis-a-vis -vis the Pakistani the Muslims and the minority, other minorities, as well as in the occupied Kashmir. I think it is incumbent upon the international community to mobilize pressure on India of all kind, because otherwise what Dr. Martin Luther King said, he said, the ultimate tragedy is not the repression and cruelty by the bad people, but the silence over that by good people. So I think the international community can no longer remain silent in the face of the horrendous policies, actions of uh, occupying power India in occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Thank you.